Welcome to the SB Grid YouTube channel. Software tutorials by developers, lectures by structural biologists, unique content brought to you by SB Grid. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining today. This is our last webinar of the session. So we started way back in October and it's July already. And so this will be the last one. Uh, we're already lining up for the next round. So um, coming up in October, uh, I think it's Stephanie Wankowitz with QFIT out of the Fraser Lab. So that's a very interesting and cool tool just to sort of keep the theme of like enhancing maps, uh, which is a nice lead in for what we're gonna be talking about Oops. today. So uh, today we've got Dennis Bruckner joining us from uh, Duca Hextra's lab here in uh, over in Cambridge uh, in, in MCB at Harvard. And we're gonna be talking about match maps, which is an application for making difference maps from non-isomorphous crystals. So Dennis, go ahead. Amazing. Thank you for the introduction. Looking forward to, to presenting to you all today. Um, so as uh, as Jason said, I'm going to tell you guys about, about Match Maps, which is this tool that I made for making non-isomorphous difference maps. Um, before I dive in, as I accidentally showed a moment ago, I'll give my plug for places that you can find Match Maps around the web. We recently uh, published our paper in the Journal of Applied Crystallography, which is your best place to hear about all of the algorithmic details that I don't have time to get into today. And we also have pretty extensive online documentation that lives on the Reciprocal Space Station website that you can find here. And I'll mention a couple times throughout uh, places in the documentation that might be useful to, to check out. Um, and this documentation lives with the uh, Reciprocal Space Station, which is what the Hextra Lab and associated collaborators are calling this suite of software packages for handling kind of non-standard diffraction experiments that you might be interested in. Great, so what I'm gonna talk about today, um, I'm gonna explain when you might want to use Match Maps. I'm gonna talk about what Match Maps does. I'm going to give you guys some examples of the package in action, and then I'll spend some time working through a user tutorial and show you how you might use Match Maps yourself. Great. <clears throat> so you should use Match Maps if two things are true. If, for one, you want to make a sensitive difference map between a pair of crystallographic data sets. These data sets perhaps are comparing a wild type to a mutant or comparing an APO structure to a ligand bound structure, comparing dark versus light in some kind of photoactive system, hot versus cold, et cetera. And when I talk about these kinds of perturbations, I'm just going to abstract them as off versus on, where on is your structure that has whatever perturbation present. Um, the other thing, that might make you want to use match maps is if your pair of data sets is not strictly isomorphous. And I use this term strictly isomorphous to mean a couple of different things. Perhaps the uh, perturbation affects the unit cell size. Perhaps the perturbation leads to some slight rotation of your protein model, and I'll talk more about that later. Perhaps your on and off data sets crystallize in different space groups entirely. Or perhaps, and I'll talk about this later, your on and off data sets are actually part of the same asymmetric unit related by non-crystallographic symmetry. In all of these cases, match maps can be a really useful application. Great. So as you may have been thinking in the first half of this slide, if just number one is true, then you may want to be using an isomorphous difference map to compare your two data sets. And before I dive into talking about match maps, it is really useful to talk a little bit about the isomorphous difference map, which is the uh, theoretical framework that we're building on here. So what does an isomorphous difference map do? An isomorphous difference map takes in these three inputs. Fundamentally, you have sets of structure factor amplitudes corresponding to your off data sets and your on data set. 
and you have some set of computed structure factor phases that corresponds to the auth model. Or perhaps you just have the auth model itself, which you can use to compute phases for that model. And if you have these three inputs, you can compute this kind of structure factor. The structure factor has an amplitude that is the difference in the amplitudes of your on and off structure factors, and then uses a single set of reference phases to describe both data sets. The advantage of this kind of data set is that it makes optimal use of the observed structure factor amplitudes, which are your data. This means that it does not use any calculated structure factor amplitudes, and in doing so, minimizes the contribution of modeling decisions to your final map. And specifically, any modeling decisions that one might make about the on data set, say the structure of the mutation or the structure of the bound ligand, are not included in this computation. So we can consider this map to be unbiased relative to that on structure. Similarly, uh, or additionally, I should say, these kinds of maps can be very sensitive to small changes because these kinds of reciprocal space subtractions are super sensitive. The disadvantage of an isomorphous difference map, as you may guess from the name, is that these maps require strict isomorphism. And I'm going to spend a couple slides talking about the kind of severity of this requirement. Um, <clears throat> the the root of this issue is that these um these structure factor phases are very sensitive to the contents of the unit cell great so if we uh just compare these three structures as an example where the key numbers that i'm pointing out here is that these first two data sets are pretty much isomorphous whereas this first and this third data set are what I'm going to call poorly isomorphous. And especially along this C-axis, as I've noted, there's a pretty large change. Um, I'm using this term poorly isomorphous because non-isomorphous is a sort of ambiguous term. It can mean this, or it can mean things are in different space groups entirely. So I'm going to refer to this situation always as poor isomorphism. Um, now, if we compare the structure factor phases of the isomorphous and poorly isomorphous uh, data sets, we see this pretty striking scatter plot. I was honestly surprised the first time I made this at just how visually striking it was. Um, but the isomorphous phases correlate extremely well, and that correlation is very much very poor in the poorly isomorphous data sets. And not to belabor the point, but we can also visualize this correlation in a resolution-dependent manner. And we see that while the correlation falls off with resolution for the isomorphous data as well, the correlation falls off very rapidly with poor, poorly isomorphous data, to the point where even at moderate resolutions that you might care about, the structure factor phases are essentially uncorrelated. Um, this is really bad news if you are hoping to share phases between these two data sets in order to make an isomorphous difference map, especially since the highest resolution structure factors are probably the ones you care about in the kind of difference you're trying to look at. And so the question becomes, how can we compare poorly isomorphous data sets? Because sharing phases directly is not going to work. The... An answer can come by rethinking the way that an isomorphous difference map is made. And so what I've shown here is essentially the same schematic that I showed earlier, where we take these three inputs and we subtract the amplitudes to get these difference structure factors. And then, of course, the final step is to apply the Fourier transform to get a real space map that represents this isomorphous difference map. But you may be thinking, or you may not, that subtraction and Fourier transform are both linear operations, and so we should be able to, without loss of generality, switch the order of them. And so in doing so, we could do the Fourier transform first and get these implicit intermediates, 
And then we could subtract those real space maps voxel wise to get ourselves this same isomorphous difference map. This, this refactoring turns out to be really useful because whereas in this intermediate, we're simultaneously applying these structure factor phases to the off data set for which they are appropriate and the on data set for which they are not appropriate. But here we've sort of factored out that difference where we have one map that has the off phases and off amplitudes that'll look pretty good. And we have this other map with on amplitudes and off phases. That is what we want to improve. That's the issue is the fact that we're using these phases with these amplitudes. And so we can ask the question, how do we make a better version of this implicit intermediate map? The question of comparing poorly isomorphous data sets has sort of boiled down to how can we make a better version of this intermediate map? And what we'd like when trying to come up with phases for this map are phases that incorporate the information of these structure factor amplitudes that tell us about model location and also just the data we're interested in. But we want some kind of phases that don't incorporate any modeling decisions that might be made about the on data set. And when we think about these two requirements, you might uh, realize that there's actually an exceedingly common method in crystallographic data analysis that does exactly these two things, and that is rigid body refinement. And specifically, if we combine our on structure factor amplitudes with an off model and perform not full refinement of atomic coordinates, but just rigid body refinement, all that we do is move that off model into the appropriate location as specified by the new data in a different space group or a different unit cell. Um, and we get along for the ride phases that I'll call uh, off calc star, which describe, uh, which, are, which are appropriate for the on structure vector amplitudes. Um, and this is, this is exactly what we want. We can actually uh, visualize what these kinds of maps look like. And if we uh, go through and perform both of these rigid body refinements, we end up with two very nice looking maps for the uh, off off data set and the on off star data set. But of course you will notice here that these data sets do not align in real space, um, which makes sense, but we've sort of just kicked the problem along the road because now we're in real space, but we still cannot subtract these data sets because they don't align. That will not be interesting. Um, and I spent a lot of time thinking about how to solve this problem of aligning two maps. Um, and thinking about, you know, pulling from the ideas of image registration or signal processing or things like that. And then I realized that it was actually far simpler than that, because when I performed these two rigid body refinements, I got along for the ride, the seemingly useless side product of two models, which differ by exactly the same transformation as do the two maps. And so models are exceedingly easy to align, especially models that are identical except for a relocation. And so we can very easily compute how we can align these two models and then apply back that same transformation and align these two maps. And with that, we have real space, unbiased, aligned maps for each of our data sets that we can subtract and get the difference map that works. And that is skipping a couple of steps, how the match maps algorithm works. Great. Um, I'm happy to, to pause for one moment if anyone has uh, questions about the, the algorithm before I dive into examples, but also fine if not. Questions, you can use the QA section if you've got a question, uh, or there's also the chat, I believe. I think we can participants that, are okay. also allowed to chat. Okay. Great. I'll okay. move on for now. Oh, right. someone is oh, wait, we've, we've got one from Pete. Oh. 
So a uh, very quick question. This is reminding me of the vector difference Fourier maps. Is that similarity, is, is that an actual similarity or is that just in my head? I am not super familiar. Can you, can you say more? Um, I am relying on memory from something in the ballpark of 12 years ago. So my okay. specifics are going to be relatively poor, but you're, you're talk when you were talking about the, the linearity of the transform and doing, mm -hmm. doing the, doing the Fourier transform before doing the subtraction that reminded me of some very old map calculations I'd seen done in my postdoc work. And it was for, for a very similar approach. But if that lack of detail is not enough to get a useful question out of it, sounds like. Cool. That is definitely something to a good, a good vocab term to look into more in the future. Thank you. Great. Um, cool. Okay. So I'm going to uh, show a couple of examples and hopefully convince you that there are situations where isomorphous difference maps do not work, but match maps does. Um, this is, is one example. These are DHFR structures, which is the protein that I work on in my, my day project. And so that's why this data set is interesting to me. But what we have here is in, in pink sticks is the, uh, the ligand conformation in the, the ground state, the off structure. And then in the on model we have, we can see that this, uh, this blue ligand kind of shifts leftward. And then this blue ligand actually swings out of the active site entirely to where this space is now empty. Um, we can compare these two data sets via an isomorphous difference map and we get kind of mostly nonsense. Um, but we can compare these two data sets via match maps and get this very clear signal corresponding to the ligand leaving the active site. We can get signal here and here corresponding to the shift of the ligand signal here and here for this carbonyl moving, and even some blue blips corresponding to this very high B-factor swung out confirmation of the ligand. Um, these are these, these same PDBs that I showed the, the scatter plots of the, the ligands of the phases earlier. Um, great. So this is an example of, uh, you know, the implications of poor isomorphism. But I want to uh, make the point that it is not just poor isomorphism that can lead you astray. Um, so this is another example that we also show in the paper, where in both of these maps, I'm showing you the positive difference density for a bound ligand computed either by an isomorphous difference map or by match maps. And you'll notice that the isomorphous difference map looks just fine. Um, in this case, the two data sets are pretty much exactly isomorphous. And if you saw just this, you might be convinced that an isomorphous difference map would, uh, would be sufficient in this case. And that might be true. Um, I also want to emphasize the kind of remarkableness of, of both of these maps, because the the map calculation of either of these does not know about the coordinates of the ligand. It doesn't really know that the ligand is there. It just knows that something is there and the structure factor amplitudes alone are enough to give this really clear, really crisp difference density for the bound ligand, which is cool. That's as much a complement to isomorphous difference maps as it is to match maps, but I still think it's neat. Now, the interesting thing about this data set is that if we compare the original deposited coordinates of the APO and bound structures, we'll see that they differ via this slight global rotation. Um, and I think this is a phenomenon that's probably familiar to a lot of folks. If you have ever opened up two PDBs from the, you know, fetched two PDBs into PyMol, Nine times out of 10, the first thing that you have to do is align them. Not for any reason that you're so interested in, but just because they're a little bit off. Um, and this is a phenomenon that just happens when comparing crystal structures. Um, and if we look at this, uh, the lateral shift along this helix in particular, which is where this rotation happens to be strong, 
we see that after you align these two structures, there's actually not really any interesting displacement of this helix in the internal relative coordinates of these structures. But what's interesting is that the structure factor amplitudes don't know how to align the models. They just know about these locations. And if you make an isomorphous difference map, you actually see very pronounced, strong difference density corresponding to this totally artifactual translation of this helix. And this difference density is similar in magnitude to the similar to the signal for the bound ligand. And so if you were coming in cold using an isomorphous difference map as your first way to look at this new exciting ligand bound structure, and you searched for peaks in coot, you might come across this very striking translation and think that it's real. Um, in the match maps map, there is a little blip of signal here, perhaps corresponding to a real translation, but there is certainly not this big pronounced translation. And my point in showing this is that match maps can reduce artifacts even in a seemingly isomorphous case. Um, you also want to say about that. Yeah, so this is uh, example number two about how in even a seemingly isomorphous case it might be worth giving a giving a match maps difference map a look. So now that you're hopefully excited about the uh, the idea of using match maps and all of the promise that it holds, I'm going to dive into talking about how you can use match maps yourself. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is the inputs and outputs of the match maps software. Match maps is available from the command line, and what you're going to provide in is two MTZs corresponding to the off and on data sets. Um, these are scaled and merged MTZs, the kind of thing you would supply to refinement. And these are your poorly isomorphous input data sets. You are also going to provide to match maps one and only one structural model, which is assumed to describe your off data <clears throat> and is also assumed to be a reasonably good rigid body refinement uh, starting guess for the on data as well. So something where the off and on data sets are wildly different is, is I think, unlikely to, to look nice here. <laughs> um, now, what does match maps give you out? What match maps gives you out by virtue of the algorithm are real space different maps. And I think that it's worth spending a moment talking about this file format, <clears throat> excuse me, because for cryoEM folks, uh, real space map or MRC or CCP4 files are likely very commonplace and familiar, but for crystallographers, they might not be because crystallographers typically just open up an MTZ in a file like Coot or PyMol, uh, uh, software like Coot or PyMol, and that software will just do the Fourier transform under the hood on the fly for you and give you a map in real space, and you never have to think about it. But because match maps inherently lives in a post Fourier transform world, it is necessary that it gives you out real space outputs. Um, so I have a page on the online documentation that walks you through all of the quirks of visualizing match maps results. It boils down in Coot to making sure that you use the open map dialog rather than either of the open MTZ dialogs. And there are also some quirks of dealing with this in PyMol that I walk through here. And if you have any issues with either of those, of course, please reach out and I'm happy to help you make beautiful figures with your match maps outputs. Um, with all of this being said, there are two key outputs that you're going to get out of match maps. They're going to share the file names with these input files, and one is going to be on minus off. This is your main difference map that you're going to want to use. You're also going to get this file called on minus off unmasked, and I'm going to talk about that uh, a little bit later on. Um, the actual usage of match maps from the command line is pretty straightforward. Um, the simplest match maps call that will run will use the, you'll evoke match maps to call. 
you will supply the uh, the off MTZ, and you also need to specify the columns of the MTZ that include your structure vector amplitudes and your structure vector phases. And likewise, for your on MTZ, you're going to supply a PDB, and that's it. And if you hit enter, this will run in probably five to 10 minutes. Um, the slowest part is the actual running of two Phoenix refinement rigid body runs. Depending on how big your data set is, that could be anywhere from like one minute to five minutes. But I always run it on my laptop and never have any issues. Um, and if you don't know what the uh, column names for your structure factor amplitudes or uncertainties are, you could use this utility, which is part of the reciprocal spaceship package or other similar options to figure out what your columns are called. You want to make sure that you are using observed structure factor amplitudes and not computed structure factor amplitudes or any other combination therein, because that will not give you the expected results. Um, I also want to make a note while I'm talking about usage that there is another very similar utility that I call matchmaps.mr for molecular replacement. And this uh, this program runs essentially identically, except that the inputs can be entirely non-isomorphs. They can be in different space groups or maybe the same space group, but entirely different crystal packings. And now, Rather than assuming that this PDB is a reasonable is a reasonable rigid body refinement starting point for each data set, you're assuming that it is a reasonable molecular replacement solution for the other data set. And then that molecular replacement is performed, and you end up with the same difference maps. Um, I will note that I would not recommend just always using uh, the molecular replacement version if you don't need to. For one, it's of course way slower. And for two, uh, as a design choice, the matchmaps.mr utility strips all of the walkers out of your structure before running. Um, I think that makes sense because any ordered waters from one space group are unlikely to make sense in the other space group, but it will you know, hurt your refinement statistics a little bit overall. So I wouldn't use this if you don't need to. And the simplest matchmaps.mr call looks exactly the same. Um, I was going through and cleaning up the uh, the various command line parameters, and I realized that they, the command line interface is exactly the same for matchmaps.mr as it is for matchmaps. So great. So I'm going to talk about some other matchmaps options that you might want to uh, to use. These are some some pretty common ones that I would recommend using. You can specify the input and output directories. I think that you should always do this. If you don't specify an output directory, your outputs will just get overwritten every time. So definitely point things to an output directory. I think that's good practice. Um, if your uh, model includes any kind of ligands that you need to display restraints files for refinement, you can do that from the command line. Um, there's a verbose option, which basically just prints out all of the Phoenix and CCP4 logs to the terminal. This is useful for debugging if Phoenix is failing for some reason. Um, I don't recommend doing it otherwise because it's super annoying. Um, I think it's very useful to be able to rerun the exact match maps commands that you have just run so that you don't have to remember all of the different parameters. If match maps runs successfully, it will always write out a script. That script by default is just going to be called run match maps, but you can give it a specific name if you've done something interesting that you want to remember with a script name. Um, <clears throat> the spacing option is very important. Um, this uh, defines the size of the real space voxels that your real space map uses. By default, this is a half an angstrom which was chosen because with any smaller than that, coop starts to become unbearably sluggish. And so you'll have a best time using half angstrom voxels. But if you're trying to look at something in PyMol, it'll look much nicer if you use smaller voxels and get a finer mesh, something like a quarter angstrom. Um, and so a typical kind of more fleshed out match maps call that you might see, you would specify some faraway directory where your data lives, you could specify an informative output name for what you're trying to use this run for. It will specify 
all of your different files. These, of course, are assumed to live not in the working directory, but in this directory. You can similarly supply, uh, specify the ligands that you need for refinement. Uh, you can specify spacing. We're trying to use this to make figures and a handy script so that we can reproduce all of this. Um, yes. There are a lot more uh, options available from the command line that I'm going to go through sort of quickly. Um, the on as stationary option just sort of switches the on and off data sets in terms of where you refine uh, or where you align. This is really useful if you have bound ligands because otherwise your um, when you open up your difference map and then you open up your bound model to compare to, you'll find that the ligand density and ligand are not in the same place, which sort of defeats the whole purpose of what we've been doing if you have to do yet another alignment to visualize your ligand. But if you use the on as stationary flag, then everything will be defined to the location of the, the assumed on model, and then everything should align nicely. I'd recommend doing this. Another thing useful with bound ligands is the option to turn off bulk solvent scaling. Um, by default, the refinement runs do include bulk solvent scaling just because this gives you the best refinement. But if you find that you have signal you're interested in that is far away from the protein model, bulk solvent, uh, bulk solvent scaling runs the risk of flattening that signal and just kind of squashing your ligand out of the map. And so you may want to consider turning off bulk solvent scaling in those cases, or if anything looks weird. Um, there are two different options for how to handle the highest resolution and or noisiest data. You can either just truncate at a certain resolution, or you can apply error weighting that functionally gets rid of your your noisiest uh, data. The full formula that this error weighting uses is ascribed in the online documentation. Um, by default, Match Maps is going to clean up all of the temporary files that are produced, but you can keep them if you would like, either for debugging or maybe trying to uh, kind of trace the process along the way and look at what different inputs and outputs look like. Um, and finally, the um, process of uh, rigid body refinement that is used by match maps is pretty standard, and I tend to think you shouldn't want to mess with it. But if you have some crazy idea for a specific kind of refinement you want the software to use, you can supply a custom .eff template to the command line that will be used instead. If you'd like to do this, A, I'd recommend reaching out to me. And B, I would recommend using the EFF template that lives in the source code as your starting point to modify from. Great. And um, as of recently, MatchMap supports both Phoenix 1.20 and earlier syntax and Phoenix 1.21 syntax. And it should automatically check your command line environment for which kind of Phoenix you're using and use the appropriate, appropriate parameter names. But if that's not working, I put in a little uh, backdoor to uh, specify override your Phoenix version so you can get everything to work. Great. And because seeing options like this, it's not always clear exactly what the, the syntax is. I just wanted to show an actual usage of each thing so that you know what's happening. Um, so for example, these three flags do not take any argument, just the existence of the flag is all that you need to turn on the behavior, whereas these flags do take an argument and you want to make sure that you supply either a number or, or a string or whatever this flag is expecting. Great. Okay, so with basic usage things out of the way, there are a couple of other kind of odd scenarios that I want to address. Um, one scenario is the situation where you have multiple protein chains present. They may be related by non-crystallographic symmetry, or they may not. Um, there are two ways that you could consider trying to use match maps with this kind of data set. One is to rigid body refine each protein chain separately. 
This is because it's not necessarily a good assumption that the uh, the two protein chains will move together in whatever way that the two data sets are different. They may move relative to each other. And you can get around that by specifying them as separate rigid bodies. And MatchMaps supplies uh, gives you the opportunity to do this with the RBR selections flag, which you follow with the chain IDs of the two different chains. This will give you out two different difference maps, one in the vicinity of chain A and one in the vicinity of chain B. Um, the other thing that you may be interested in <clears throat> is to use the third match maps utility, matchmaps.ncs, to subtract the chains from each other. And the syntax for doing so is as follows. Um, this is essentially analogous to making an internal difference map that you might make across some kind of crystallographic symmetry operation. Um, but if the the symmetry operation you want to subtract across is non-crystallographic, then that kind of uh, calculation doesn't make any sense in reciprocal space. And so instead, you will want to do this real space calculation that is made available by matchmaps.ncs. I should note that by virtue of this utility requiring only one MTZ and one PDB, that depending on how you prepare your inputs, it is possible that this utility is, this output is not actually free of model bias. Though you could imagine preparing your PDB more carefully such that you avoid model bias uh, for one chain or the other. If you have any questions about this, I would love to chat about it and hear what you're trying to look at. Um, Matchmaps.ncs, yes, great. Um, Cool. And so the last thing that I want to that I want to talk about is the one area of match maps that's a real uh, active area of development, which is thinking about how best to mask out symmetry bits. Um, it's a sort of weird problem that arises by virtue of some of the real space calculations that are done in match maps. So what we're looking at here, are the, uh, the rigid body refinement outputs for the like on and off data from a particular use of match maps. And you can see the yellow model here corresponds with the yellow map and likewise for the magenta. And here we have our symmetry mates of the two, um, the yellow and magenta models, which also have their associated maps. And what we want to do is align this yellow map onto this magenta map so that we can subtract them. And when we do that, we see that for the main copy that we care about, this works great. But for the symmetry mate, the alignment uh, gets a symmetry operation applied to it, essentially, and does not actually align things in the way that we expect it to. Um, this is weird. This is sort of a quirk of what parts of the match maps algorithm are or are not in P1. Um, but it's just sort of a, a fact of this kind of algorithm. This is really annoying, though, because then when we try to make a difference map, we're going to see this very large, very obviously artifactual difference signal for the symmetry mate. And of course, we only see this for the area that hugs near to the actual copy, main copy that we care about. Um, and the obvious solution to this is to just apply a tighter solvent mask, which gets rid of the majority of this artifactual signal. Um, the way that match maps is written at present is that this masked radius is hard-coded at two angstroms, whereas this unmasked radius is set at a default of five angstroms, but is changeable by the user from two to eight angstroms. And this may be useful depending on how far away from your main model you expect to see interesting different signal. Um, and this can be implemented at the command line with the unmasked radius parameter, and then a number. I specify in the parameter name that this is the unmasked radius so that you remember that you are not changing this smaller 
masked radius. And the two different uh, output maps that match maps makes, one of them is called the unmasked map, and that is the one that this unmasked radius is going to impact. Um, just to give a slightly more informative example of why you might care about this masking, um, if we look at this example, which is the same bound ligands that I showed earlier, but this time in Coot, what we see is that this uh, region of the ligand is actually too far away from the protein model and is outside of the solvent mask. And so we don't get any ligand signal for this region. And when we instead look at the unmasked map, we see that we pick up the desired signal for the ligand. Um, it's a funny quirk because, of course, in this situation, the information about where you want to see and not see signal is known by the user because the user already has this ligand bound structure. But <clears throat> the entire spirit of match maps and of isomorphous difference maps is to like not cheat and to try to have the algorithm do as best as you can without using the information about this bound ligand. Um, all of this to say, a better algorithm is coming soon. I have thoughts about how to do this. There are just some implication confusions. And my hope is that the release of Match Maps 1.0 will coincide with a new and improved implementation of this kind of uh, this kind of solvent masking that will not give you annoying artifactual signal around the borders of your protein. If anyone has any thoughts about this or would like to contribute, I would of course love to to hear about it. Great. And that is all I have for you guys. Hopefully you now are familiar with uh, with what Match Maps does and with how you might use it. And I would be excited to take any questions. Oh, and I wanna give special thanks to uh, to my PI, Duca, who was amazing and very supportive through this process. Harrison Wang in our lab was very useful with uh, testing and other things like that. Um, members of the Fraser Lab did a open source review on BioArchive and uh, included uh, contributed some very important feedback, including that led to the uh, skip BSS flag. And Martian, who is the wizard of Gemi, was very useful in getting all of the implementation set up. Yes, okay, that's it. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much, guys. That's uh, fantastic. We have some questions. Uh, first here from the chat from uh, Jim Thorpe. Do you have a comparison of match maps versus Phoenix superimpose underscore maps? And if so, um, do you have any thoughts on uh, how the underlying algorithms differ and where match maps shows improvement? So correct me if I'm wrong. And if I'm wrong, I will answer the question more extensively. But I believe that Phoenix superimpose maps requires two maps and two models um which was the sort of key problem that we were trying to avoid um that we were trying to have a, a method that could work when you hadn't yet modeled your on state the, hmm. this could be the first thing that you do after scaling and merging your on data set is make an isomorphous difference map or make a match maps difference map I have not used that that utility, so I don't know for sure if it requires two models or not. But, but in your current approach, you use the same model with the structure factor amplitudes from uh, the two different, so that you're, okay. And then you're doing essentially a rigid body refinement into those two different, and then so you've got a translation or some orientation between those. And so it doesn't necessarily, because it's rigid, doesn't necessarily absorb the phase bias that you would have from the conformational differences. So obviously there would be some, well, it's preserved, right? So, okay, I got it. Mm -hmm. It's it's essentially the same thing that's being done implicitly by an isomorphous difference map. Mm -hmm. Right. So what are the limits across so, I mean, 
different space groups, different, I mean, how non-isomorphous, um, at what point would it make more sense to just reduce symmetry to a common symmetry among two different, like if you had two different, say, I don't know, you could, I guess, in some fundamental level, I'll go back to P1 or something, right? Like, but to be able to get to um, a point where you would be able to make difference maps across different sort of space groups or something similar. Right, so the, yep. so the mat map, oh, so the mat maps dot MR utility is what mm -hmm. should, my goodness, is what should, uh, should save you there. Because with the the match maps .mr utility, you are allowed to provide inputs that are in different space groups entirely. Um, so exactly the boundary of when you should do this versus when you should use the main utility is, I think, not exactly clear to me. But typically, things lie far from one side or the other of that boundary. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what you're. The main match maps utility is what you're going to want to use in situations where the crystal packing is essentially the same, but a a an axis is off by three percent or five percent or something like that. Um, match maps or temperature differences, or, yeah, like room right. temperature versus temperature differences. Uh, frozen, yeah, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, one of the examples that we look at in the in the paper is a high pressure data set. Um, this kind of map is for uh, inputs that are in different space groups entirely. So if you if you have you know a wild type structure of your protein and then you make a mutation and you're only able to crystallize that mutation in a different space group entirely, um, of course you can't make an isomorphous difference map between those two data sets. That doesn't make any sense, but you can make a match maps.mr difference map between those two data sets. Um, I think the the other important question <clears throat> is how what kind of structural change is uh, is uh, like allowed for the algorithm. Um, for example, you know, if you had a like major domain motion of your protein where the like one domain of the protein moved five angstroms relative to the other domain. Um, you're now getting to the point where the assumption that the same model is a reasonably good rigid body refinement solution for both data sets is maybe not valid. Right. And so you may end up getting maps that look kind of crummy and differences that look kind of crummy. Um, so I guess it, implicit here is that the types of structural differences that difference maps are sensitive to uh, are on the same scale so that there's this rigid body refinement uh, is valid, right? Because, yeah. because you're not going to use FO minus FO difference maps to look at a five X from domain movement, right? You, you can right. refine those coordinates and just look, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Duca would want me to mention that in principle, the reason, apologies, I know this is really annoying to look at. In principle, the reason for allowing uh, custom EFF specification is if you wanted to try to do something wonky and handle like that. If you wanted to specify, I want residues 1 to 100 to be one rigid body and residues 101 to 200 to be a different rigid body. In theory, you could then use match maps to refine away the change that you don't care about to get the best signal for the change that you do care about. Um, I can't necessarily endorse that approach, and I haven't tried it, but it is something that is in theory possible within the realms of the software. Yeah, and that would be only for like large structural changes between mm -hmm. the two, right? And I guess in some cases you could even do like a sliding window across the sequence of one of the models and then look at the distribution that you get across all of those rigid body refinements because they're pretty fast and just see is that, mm -hmm. is there a huge distribution there? If there is, then you know, okay, 
maybe this isn't going to be valid, right? Or maybe this is going to be uh, a large structural change because, yeah, like a big loop movement or something, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, great. Any other questions? If not, uh, thank Dennis again. Thank you very much. Super interesting tool. Uh, it's in SP Grid now. Um, we'll be following it for updated versions and keeping an eye on it going forward. And thank you very much for uh, agreeing to give the webinar. Yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate Great. it. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining.